Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. It's time for Ask a Crafter, and I'm filming this on March 18th, 2021. And if you've got a question for an upcoming episode, you can go over to my channel by clicking my name below the video. It will take you to my YouTube channel, and you'll see some words across the top. There'll be like videos, um, playlists, community about, you wanna click on community and look at the most recent Ask a Crafter thread. That's where you can leave your questions for an upcoming episode of Ask a Crafter. And please vote for the questions you wanna hear answered. The more votes a question gets, the more likely it is to be answered. So uh, first up, we have Pam Bickford. She's wondering, what are the primary sources of pigments? This is really interesting because a lot of times people think that all of our art pigments are dug up from the ground, and that's how some of our pigments are harvested. Um, pigments that come from minerals, such as lapis lazuli, and um, there's a bunch of paints that are sold from Daniel Smith that are all earth pigments, like they're made from rocks. They tend to be super granulating and um, really earthy looking, not your super vibrant colors. Uh, all of your browns generally come from earth pigments such as rusts and iron oxides. And um, then the other source for pigments other than the mineral based and the earth based ones are plant based. So there are um, dyes that come from plants and flowers and they are combined with a salt or a mordant that make them color fast. And those are pigments that do tend to fade, your plant based pigments. And then there's a third type of pigments that are actually made in, um, made in, factories made in uh, by scientists, made by chemists. Those are synthetic pigments. Those would be like your quinacridones and your thalocyanes, and they're, they're really bright colors. A lot of times they are made, um, uh, they're actually more light fast than the plant-based natural pigments. They're really um, gorgeous, and they don't typically make them for us painters. The people they make these pigments for, these colorants, are mo miss mostly for I've been talking all day, guys. This is like my fifth video today. <laughs> um, they're mostly being being requested by the automotive industry and the plastics industry. So when a pigment goes, um, like uh, when they say a pigment is extinct or pigment is no longer available, it's not that they've stopped finding it in the ground. It's that the scientists have stopped making it because there's not enough demand from the automotive industry, like uh, quinacridone gold. There just stopped being enough demand in the automotive industry that they stopped making it. So what was left was what was left. And uh, like Daniel Smith bought all that up so they could have enough for their quinacridone gold paint until it ran out. It's kind of a little bit of a marketing gimmick, I think, because it's not like these these pigments could never be made again. They'll be made again when the demand is for them again. Um, pigments that are, there are pigments that are made for cosmetics and food, and sometimes those work their way into like craft grade products where, um, or children's grade art products where the, um, where the necessity for a non-toxic product outweighs the necessity of a light fast product. And also dyes that are meant for plastics are generally cheaper than dyes that are made for automotive. They don't need to resist fading as much. And that's when you're gonna see some of those um, cheaper, well-performing paints that tend not to be light fast show up. Um, so that's generally where you, the, the sources of your pigments, you've got synthetic made in factories, you've got plant-based and you've got mineral-based or, or organic plant-based or organic, they come from something living, or inorganic, it comes from um, like a rock or something that was never living. So I hope that clears that up. It's uh, it's really interesting, isn't it? There's some really great resources you can check out. If you go to the website Handprint, there's lots of information on pigments there. You can check the pigments on your paint tubes and see how light fast they are. You can even see what brands have more light fast versions of different, different uh, pigments. You can learn about pigments that are no longer available. And um, it's just kind of fun to geek out and get all nerdy about pigments. If so if you want more information, I would definitely recommend checking that out. There's also the Wilcox Guide to Pigments. I don't know if that's still in print or not, but uh, that was a really interesting book. Um, well, it put some people to sleep, but not me. <laughs> I, I love learning about pigments. All right, I'm going to be pulling a few questions that did not get the votes um, that I personally thought were kind of interesting on uh, on this episode because uh, there's so many, there's, you know, there's so many interesting things out there, you know? Um, let's see. Um, I have someone asking, uh, Zeneca204 is asking, have I ever used a wet palette such as um, uh, Red Grass Games wet palette for acrylic painting? If so, what was your experience? I have not used that brand, but I do have a Stay Wet palette. It's actually the Palette Seal by Masterson, I believe, and I've had that since... Um, gosh, I was in high school. I really like it, and what I like about it is it's a really big, like, 12 by 16 
one and a half inch thick Tupperware, basically is what it is. And you can lay paper towels down in it and then lay a piece of palette paper down in there and have a, um, a place to put your acrylic paints and then it won't dry out. You, so you put paper towels down, you spritz it with water, you put palette paper down and you squirt out your paints. And as long as you cover it up when you're not using it, your paints will stay fresh for quite a while. You might have to spritz your paint with a spray bottle of water if you're gonna be painting with it open for a long time, but it generally keeps your paint very well. Thing I also really like about that is that if I'm doing oil painting, I just take my a pad of palette paper, I set it in there, I squeeze my oil paints out and I use it and then I seal it up when I'm done. It's fantastic. Um, I haven't used other brands, but that that's great. Great. And sometimes I'll use like the Dollar Tree cutting mats because they fit in there perfectly and I'll use that to um, to put my paint on, especially if it's, um, you know, because I can put the, I can just spritz it as needed and put the wet paper towels down the bottom. The only drawback is that you don't want to forget about it because if you have wet paper towels in there and you have that sealed up for like a month and you haven't even opened it, you could end up with a mildewy mess. But that's the only drawback. I highly recommend something like that. And you definitely could find a shallow piece of Tupperware or like takeout container, like those little bento boxes and do something very similar yourself. So you don't need to go buy it, but I do have the Masterson one and I really like it. And I'll try to link that down below if I think about it. Um, I assume they're probably still being made. It wasn't the crazy expensive. I think it was um, under $20, you know, and it's lasted uh, over 20 years. So, <laughs> so I'd say it's a pretty good product. They also make something called a palette seal, which comes with a reusable sponge that you wet rather than having to use paper towels. And I think they sell special palette paper for it. But, um, but I didn't have that one, so I can't really remark on that. It was more expensive, so I didn't go with that one. Um, Stacy Daly asks, how do I mix pink uh, in watercolor? Well, basically you want to find a cool leaning red such as quinacridone rose, rose matter, alizarin crimson, and add water to it until you get to the pink that you like. Now, if you want a color that's got a little bit more body to it, you can add Chinese white. Chinese white is a transparent mixing white. It's not going to give you as much of a pastel pink as it is going to give you it's not going to give you an opaque pink, I should say. It will give you a little bit of a pastel tone to it, but basically it controls so you're not putting so much water in that you've got this one color that's super runny and like making your other colors blossom. So that's why you have get Chinese white in your watercolor set sometimes. They're not really for highlights. It's not strong enough for that. It's a mixing white, and a lot of people don't realize that. It's for when you really want to dilute that color down, but you don't want to change the viscosity of the paint because it could interact with the other paints and cause blossoms. Um, let's see. I just wanna, I, I don't like people getting left out and um, I kind of had the uh, the over, um, doing over, doing comments that had more than 10 thumbs ups. And so there were some other really good questions in there. So I just wanna give them a chance, you know? Um, so Teresa Atkinson asks, Atkinson, when would you choose acrylic gouache over acrylic paint? Um, probably given the choice, if I'm doing a painting, I'd choose acrylic gouache simply because I like the finish. I like that matte finish. So anytime you want a matte finish versus a glossy finish, go with acrylic gouache. It's also really nice if you like to work in a sketchbook or an art journal because non-glossy paints are less sticky, especially if you live someplace that's humid. If you have two paintings facing each other that are done with traditional acrylic paints, they could stick when you shut the book, even if it feels dry, they could be a little sticky eventually when moisture from the air interacts, but your acrylic gouache it doesn't have as much of the acrylic binder in there, so they're not gonna be sticky. And plus you can also work over it, so anytime you wanna work over with another media, such as pastel or colored pencil, or maybe you wanna stamp on top, having an acrylic gouache as your base is going to be much nicer than having the, the shiny acrylic paint because everything else is just not gonna to wanna to stick to it. Alrighty. Um, oh, this is a good one. Penny Cormier asks, when people ask if I'd paint something for them, is there a standard contract that would help? How do I decide what my time is worth? Um, there is a chart going around uh, that I've seen um, on the internet that, uh, gosh, just, just Google artist painting pricing chart and you'll probably pull up this thing that looks like a table um, and it will go like, it's, a, it's for formulating your paintings by square inch. And so it'll give you on one side of the column, it says like 25 cents, 75 cents, a dollar to whatever. Um, and then it shows you what size your painting is and how much you should charge basically by what you price per square inch. Um, that's one way to do it. I generally would kind of estimate what it would, what, how much time it would cost, it would take. Um, so estimate how much time it would take realistically 
and then um, multiply that by what you want to make per hour then add on the cost of your materials. And then you might even want to add on a little contingency because it's going to take you longer and your materials might cost more. I would do plus the retail cost of your materials. That way, you know, let's say you need to replace something and it costs more than when you bought it. Originally, you know, you factor in for those, um, for those instances. Plus, if you're going to do this painting for somebody today, they might want another one in a year, and if prices go up on materials, you're not going to be that far off. So make sure you're getting a current retail price for your materials, and then your hourly wage, whatever that, whatever you deem that to be for your expertise, your expertise times how many hours it's going to take you. I feel like that's a lot more fair than going by the square inch, because you might have a 16 by 20 painting, but it's on a white background, and it's like a flower in the middle you know, versus a painting where you're painting the entire area, you know, and everything is, is getting some time and attention. And also, you know, you could have a painting that's super, super detailed that took 10 hours, and you could have a painting that same size that's really loose, it took one hour. You know, so I think it's a little more fair to go your time times what you want to make an hour plus materials. That's just me. And, you know, you've got to, you know, and you can see, you can add it up, you can say what I'd like to make, but if you add that up in that, that, um, that some just seems outrageous, then, you know, you might want to look around at local galleries and see what they're charging, or even like gift shops and things like that, or even restaurants when they have paintings up. You might just want to kind of just get a little barometer of what, what things are going for in your area. Because I know like we're, as artists, notorious for undercharging our work, but, um, but you also have to provide something that people can afford, you know. Uh, that's my thoughts anyway. If, if anybody else has another pricing strategy and they want to share it down below, please do because I don't often sell my work. I used to, but um, I make most of my income from teaching. So, uh, let's see. Uh, I just want to pick out a couple more questions. Okay. Um... Oh, oh, this is a good one. And I don't know the question, so I'm hoping you guys can answer this question. Eliza MB Day asks, I want to know if you know anything about reinking typewriter ribbons, like a normal stamp pad reinking, long shot, from Eliza in Sydney, Australia. Um, I don't, but I bought my daughter a vintage typewriter last year for Christmas at an antique shop, and it came with a ribbon, but I couldn't find a replacement ribbon for it, so I want to reink it, but I'm not sure what to use. I'm thinking that. Ranger Archival might work re really well, or actually, no, probably maybe one of my pigment ink refills. I'm not sure. So if you know what sort of stamp pad refill I can use for that typewriter ribbon, I would love it. And uh, Eliza would appreciate it too. So Eliza, check out the comments. I'm sure our community will have an answer for us because I don't really know either. And I really want to know. Um, oh, this is a good one too. Um, by R-D-I-L-K. I don't know how it's pronounced, so I spelled it out. Um, Let's see, I've seen many videos where you mentioned Bristol being fairly accepting of water-based media. Um, is it Bristol board or something specific? Well, yeah, it's called Bristol board. It's really like a heavy cardstock, almost like poster board weight, and it's just sold as Bristol, and I recommend getting the smooth, and that works really well for your water-based markers. It'll work well with watercolor. It'll work well, well with alcohol markers. Just make sure you're using an ink pad that is compatible with those medias, and it's a really great all-around medium that you can color on. I've used Strathmore, I've used Canson, um, I'm trying to think if there's any other brands that I've personally used, but those are pretty widely available and it's fairly affordable. It's much cheaper than like hot press watercolor paper. You can do colored pencil on it. It's a really great um, all around, all around paper. Now she left a really long comment here, um, but I think that was pretty much the gist of it. So yeah, um, Strathmore or Canson, both budget friendly, both work really well. Oh, DT Hurley is wondering if there's any Crafter Square products from the Dollar Tree that I was not pleased with and will not be repurchasing. Ooh, that's salty. Let's see. Um, gosh, uh, yes, those watercolors. I'm not buying those again. <laughs> I mean, they were fine for a dollar. I didn't have really high hopes, but I, I put those right in the donation box. Uh, I wouldn't buy those again. Um, but generally, I've been pretty happy with the different things that I've bought from them. I've really enjoyed the stickers. Um, you might want to put a little glue on some of the stickers. Uh, mine were older too, so that might be why. Um, I've never tried their adhesive foam square, so I don't know if those hold up or not. Um, but generally, yeah, I don't think there's anything else that I've been really unhappy with that I've, that I've bought 
from the Crafter Square line. I haven't bought the Crafter Square brand glue. Uh, I've heard mixed reviews on that, but I have bought the Elmer's uh, little tubes, the little Elmer's um, school glue tubes from craft, from their craft department at Dollar Tree, and I really like those. I looked for those last time I was there, and I didn't see them, um, so I don't know if they still carry them or not. But like the little pokey tools, that's really good. Uh, the twine seems pretty good. Yeah, I really don't have any qualms. I just wouldn't buy that the watercolor again. <laughs> um... Yells Yells asks, um, ink pads, what do you recommend for bringing back, bringing ink pads back to life? Well, I'd recommend a reinker from that company that makes the ink pad if you can, but if not, I do have a video that goes over several recipes on how to refill your ink pads. So if you go to my channel, click the magnifying glass and search how to refresh ink pads or ink pad refill, it should pop up because I do have several different videos on that on how to make your own ink if you don't have the reinkers available. And we are going to wrap it up with this last question by Nancy Pollan. She asks, how do you organize your 12 by 12 papers? Um, I've got a couple different ways. The first thing that I do, uh, the first thing that I did, and this was a purchase, you could probably find these at like junk shops and flea markets. Um, and maybe they even make them new now because of the renewed interest in vinyl albums. But I bought a record, like a, uh, you know, records that you play in a record player. I bought a record cabinet. And I store my 12 by 12 cardstocks in that. I actually store all my cards, plain cardstocks in that, but it's perfect because record albums are 12 by 12. And it has like all those little slots that are about like three inches wide. It's perfect for putting your pattern paper in there or your cardstock. Um, I like it for cardstock because it's a little bit sturdier, so standing it on its side is good. Plus, it's pretty full, so it doesn't get bent because it's so full. So that's my first recommendation because you can find cute like vintage record cabinets that are ideal for that. You can also use milk crates, like the uh, the actual, um, like from the milk company's milk crates, if you can find those at, at antique stores, those are the perfect size as well. But they might be a little bit more difficult to pull your paper in and out unless they're in their own little paper envelopes or something. And the other thing that I use for my 12 by 12 paper, is, and I do have, if you go to my YouTube channel and you look uh, search the video, how to store it paper, um, so I did a how to store it series a few years ago. You'll see my cubes that I have in my storage area, but I've got uh, 12 by 12 cubes. Actually, I think they're 14 by 14 cropper hopper cubes and they've got dividers in it and I store them horizontally. So those would be like my pattern papers and specialty papers. And what I do is I recently went through all of my pads of pattern paper and I pulled out things that I knew I would use and I got rid of the rest and I sorted them by how I would use them. So I sorted them into categories that made sense for me. Your categories might be different. You might go by color. I do my card cardstock by color. Eh, my cardstock by color, but I do my pattern papers by theme. And so I, one of my themes is vintage. One of my themes is modern and bright. One of my themes is childhood. One of my themes is birthday. So um, that's how I separate my papers and I put them in these really big, um, and you can make them out of poster board from the Dollar Tree. I can't remember where I got mine, but I had these 12 by 12 file folders and I just put them all in the file folder and I slide it in the slot. So when I'm doing a scrapbook page or I'm doing a card and I know I'm, I want to do a vintage theme or I know I want to do a um, like a uh, kind of fun, modern, bright, fresh looking theme, I pull out that one. You might divide it by florals and travel and you know things like that. It's whatever themes make sense to you. Maybe you have, maybe all your video, all of your um, papers are vintage, so you might have them by vintage travel or, you know, girl theme, boy theme, you know, things like that. So just divide it up however it makes sense to you. I used to do my pattern papers um, by color, but I found that that didn't really work for me because I'm always looking for paper by theme, so that, that worked for me. You should choose whatever works for you. You can also find accordion files, like expandable file boxes that you can store 12 by 12 in. I would look and, and look at paper storage. I would I would search that first, like online, and see what the options are and see if there's something that you can DIY yourself. I know um, like the, the boxes that you get at Sam's Club that um, silk uh, soy milk would come in and also like organic milk would come in. They'd come in these nice like 12 by 12, um, six by four, oh, and how big is a uh, half gallon? Maybe that's five inches deep, I'm not sure you know, half gallon, like cardboard milk container size. Um, it would be that deep and that was perfect for storing pads of, of my cardstock. And I used that for quite a long time until I got my cube units and it worked great. It protected the edges and that's really what you want. So um, yeah, 
record cabinets though, they're awfully cute and you can definitely find them for a steal at flea markets. So I hope you found this this episode of Ask a Crafter helpful. I know a lot of you guys will, you know, clean your house or do your dishes or have it on while you're doing your craft projects. So thank you so much for spending some time with me today. I really do appreciate it. Um, I really appreciate the community that we have here. And if you have any questions for an upcoming episode, just make sure to leave it over on my YouTube channel on, under the community tab in the Ask a Crafter thread. Uh, that way I can keep them all together. Because as you know, I am not the most organized person in the world. So having that all in one spot makes it so I don't miss anything. And um, make sure you vote for the questions you like best so I know what I want to answer. Because I had like 130 questions in there, so I can't answer them all. And I want to answer the ones that are the most um, most requested. So I wish I could do them all, but I'm just not that good. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, happy crafting. Bye.